Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Bacall, your moderator for today's live stream series 2020 event. And I'm the Senior Director for Electric Power at Series. We're a sustainability nonprofit working with influential investors and companies from around the world on a host of global sustainability challenges like water risk, the climate crisis, and deforestation. We want to start today by saying that our hearts go out to all of those seriously affected by the global pandemic. And we're especially grateful to those on the front lines risking so much and working so hard to ensure that we all stay as healthy and safe as possible. And I want to thank each of you for participating. We realize that your personal and professional lives have been profoundly disrupted in ways that was really quite unfathomable just a couple months ago. But your commitment and courage shown by your participation today means so much to us. Uh, for me, this is actually my 20th consecutive series conference, and I, I can't believe I never would have predicted that here I would be um, with you, com coming to you from my daughter's bedroom uh, because of a global pandemic, but here we are. We're also so very grateful for the generous commitment and support of our speakers and sponsors who have stood by us on this digital journey to reimagine Series 2020. We clearly would not be here today without your essential support. Somehow, against the odds, we were able to transform our intended in-person convening to a digital program together. And a, a special shout out to our events team is, who has worked so hard to make this happen and to so many of you. The profound commitment and conviction of so many in our, in our communities to address the dual existential threats that are plaguing our global community gives us hope. But now I'm going to jump in with a few housekeeping notes. First of all, this session is being recorded and we'll provide all participants with a link to the recording shortly after its completion. And if you have questions for the speakers, please enter them in the chat box that's located on your control panel. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible as we get toward the end of the session. And also, finally, just please note that uh, due to global bandwidth issues, there could be uh, some technical challenges. Unfortunately, this is beyond our control, but what we would do is we pause for 30 seconds to allow for bandwidth to readjust. Hopefully that won't happen, but in the, in the event it does, uh, please bear with us. Now, I'm really uh, delighted to introduce a great panel of speakers. Thanks again for joining us. Um, I'll just quickly introduce them and then we'll get going. So we have Nick Steckler, who's team lead for US Power for Bloomberg NEF. We have Eva Zlotnika, Managing Director of Value Act Capital, and also a board member of Hawaiian Electric Industries. We have Mason Emnet, Vice President of Competitive Market Policy from Exelon, and Swami Venkataraman, who's Senior VP and Manager of ESG Analytics and Integration for Moody's. So, um, what we, we want to dive in on the session now, and we'll uh, invite speakers to, to share their perspectives. First of all, um, you know, I've been focusing on the power sector and the issue of climate change for quite some time now, and there's clearly a lot of transition happening. There's a, a pretty dramatic shift away from coal towards renewable energy and natural gas. Uh, and even just a few years ago, companies were not setting long range greenhouse gas goals and they started setting them. It was a very encouraging sign, but they, they started with these 80% by 2050 goals. Um, a couple years ago, and we've uh, we've now seen a ratcheting up of ambition, where more and more companies are setting net zero by 2050 and even by 2040 in some cases. So some encouraging signs. Uh, we're seeing a um, increase in ambition also of these 2030 uh, interim goals that are even more meaningful. And many of the biggest carbon emitters are committing between 50 and 80 percent reductions by 2030. Uh, a lot of this has been the result of um, investor and consumer pressure. Investor pressure coming from the Climate Action 100 Plus initiative that Ceres is so involved with, uh, and many other efforts as well, all trying to get closer to alignment with the Paris Climate Agreement. At the same time, there are big questions, such as how big a role should natural gas play? How far can renewable energy take us from, and how, how are we able to integrate it? How much innovation does the sector need to meet it need in order to meet those net zero goals. Of course, all sectors are now dealing with a global pandemic, pandemic that is causing enormous disruption, but is the power sector at a relative advantage compared to others, like for example, oil and gas? 
So first, we're going to turn to, to Nick Steckler for a quick overview of what's happening in the sector. And so, Nick, what are you seeing from the standpoint of an industry in transition trying to decarbonize? And what challenges or opportunities is it facing as a result of the COVID pandemic? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Great to be here with you guys. I should say, to start out, uh, the, the question about natural gas is, is really front and center. It's really a good one to start with. Uh, on my side, I, I am, I'm here on behalf of Bloomberg's research business, Bloomberg NEF. Bloomberg, I should say, does have Bloomberg Philanthropies, which is very active in the space of trying to answer that question of what's the role of natural gas on the philanthropic side. From just looking at the fundamentals, which is what I'm going to do, we, we do a lot of research on this. And actually, in fact, sometimes we have to understand if those types of philanthropic efforts, what their impact will be on the market and then communicate it for our clients. So we've, we've looked at this from a few angles. But just looking at the fundamentals to give you our outlook on, on the gas market, it's probably best if I do it from a regional, uh, a more regionally nuanced view. But we've come off of a very big boom in natural gas build, new builds 2018, 2019, primarily carried by the PJM mid Atlantic region in those years. We saw a lull in new builds that was starting to pick back up before the pandemic, but not to the, the levels that we'd seen before. And then the question there is why? Well, we see the fundamentals for new build gas still really being carried by the PJM region. There's a lot of really cheap gas in other pockets in uh, Texas, for example, some places in the Midwest. And uh, really the gas there is cheap, as cheap as it ever was, but there's some reasons why the, the question when you ask it on a regional level, it starts to break down and the, the new build opportunities for, for new gas turbines just really aren't there in a lot of places. Policy for one in certain states, certain markets is really prohibiting new gas builds in places like California, New York, in other markets where renewables have become so competitive um, and have just taken a big share of the mix. There's not as many running hours or opportunities for these big gas turbines anymore, like in Texas, for example where you can find some pretty cheap gas in Texas. Um, and actually the, the market is incredibly supply constrained these days. We ran an analysis at the end of last year looking to see whether new open cycle or combined cycle gas turbines could turn a profit um, in, in the ERCOT market. And it is really, it's a tough case to make to try to get a new plant there and, and very risky. So we think it's gonna continue to be carried by uh, PJM primarily and um, that there's enough going on there to, to trouble investors with uh, reforms and market market reforms. So that's a whole other story. The other part of the question is the other places where we do see um, some good fundamentals left for building gas or displacing coal in the southeast and the Midwest. There it's more falling on to the decisions of the regulators and those regulated utilities. But we also are increasingly seeing uh, deciding to build less gas, displace more of that with renewable power and starting to experiment with PV plus storage as well. Great, thank you, Nick. So, uh, and you, you just mentioned investors and what they're focused on. So let's turn to Eva. Um, so Eva, as an active investor focused on ESG and on this sector in particular, and also as a board member of um, an electric power company that in, in Hawaii that some way might say is on the bleeding edge of this transition, just lots of change happening there. What are you seeing from the standpoint of both risk and opportunity as it faces this sector? Well, thanks first of all for um, inviting me to join you. Um, and as you said, I'm, I'm speaking mostly from an investor perspective, um, but also what we've seen in, in Hawaiian Electric, but also other geographies and other companies as well. Um, I should mention up front that we, we invest across industries, so not only in utilities and energy. So if you're with me, I'm a, I'm a generalist, not a specialist. Um, but ultimately, you know, at, at a high level, we're looking for high quality businesses that are solving environmental and social issues because our investment thesis is that those will be the companies of the future that will generate a return uh, for the environmental and social value they create through uh, their product or service or technology. Um, this also means that, that a lot of our portfolio, particularly within the energy ecosystem, will likely benefit from you know, regulatory or market mechanisms that may evolve, like a carbon tax. Um, of course, we don't count on this, but um, it's a result of our process and the types of companies we're, we're looking for. Um, 
you know, you asked about risks and opportunities. You know, I think the main risk is probably time, um, meaning uh, will some of these solutions play out um, or, or when? Uh, but we're long-term investors and, and uh, we're fortunate to have uh, be managing patient capital. Um, the opportunities we see in the energy ecosystem range from utilities becoming um, owners and operators of robust smart grids to um, the circular economy and even some compliance markets favoring uh, renewable fuels, particularly um, things like renewable diesel, like here in California, um, uh, to hydrogen powered trucks, which um, of course uh, can help unlock um, some of uh, e even you know, further out uh, available technologies and fuels um, for the energy sector. And each of those vary in time uh, in terms of whether they play out in the near term versus medium term versus long term. And that's a deliberate element of our, our particular strategy. Um, so while, of course, we may be pa patient investors to some extent, of course, we also don't have unlimited time, um, given given the, the decarbonization, you know, ultimate goal um, of combating climate change. And uh, uh, as 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 many of you may know, um, Hawaii was the first state to pass a 100% renewable energy goal with a deadline of, of 2045. Uh, it's no surprise that it's an eco-conscious state that has to grapple being on one of the most isolated remote pieces of land um, in the world, sustaining a population of 1.5 million people. Um, you know, Hawaii also relies heavily on imported fuel oil to supply its energy. So what I'll say about uh, from, from the Hawaiian context is that uh, really truly it must succeed in solving this challenge, both for its own sustainability, uh, but also for the rest of us looking to, to its leadership and as you put it, um, being on the, on the bleeding edge um, of this decarbonization transition. Um, the challenge ultimately of course is shifting from fossil fuels towards renewable energy in a way that is both affordable and stable. Um, from a technological grid perspective. So, you know, it's, it's part regulatory challenge, it's part technological challenge, part physical or geographical, um, part social or societal. And at its core, it's a multi-stakeholder problem uh, with, with no silver bullet, really. Um, Hawaii's figured out a lot of the pieces, but not all of them yet. Um, and I'd like to say that not if, but when, or, or maybe as it figures them out, Hawaii can be the model for utilities and regulators around the country and maybe the world, certainly for other island economies. Um, and it's, it's not an easy challenge to figure out, but if we collectively can't figure this out in Hawaii, then, then honestly, we're in trouble. So, you know, we're, we're, we're particularly excited about um, the opportunities there, but, um, you know, still rife, of course, with, with, with many questions uh, to be answered and a lot of which, of course, we'll discuss today. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Eva. That was great. And and I think we'll follow up a little bit later on some of the issues around um, the change that we're that you're seeing in, in Hawaii and how it relates to customer engagement and things like that. Um, great. So now we'll we'll actually hear from um, Mason, who's with Exelon. And you know, it's important to note that Exelon is very different from both Hawaiian Electric Industries um, in Hawaii and also very different from some of the really big carbon emitters that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, Exelon was a company that back in the 90s recognized that climate change would be a major driver for this sector and positioned itself to become the largest gener generator of nuclear energy and still is. So, so Mason, can you speak to what you're seeing um, across the industry? Uh, Exelon obviously both has a lot of generation, but then also significant um, utilities uh, or significant number of utilities in its portfolio. Uh, that that deliver electricity to customers. So can, if you could speak a little to the challenges you're seeing and um, especially some of the issues related to uh, policy and power markets, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, so first, thanks you know, also for being part of this conversation. Um, this is what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis um, within our various business units. And so it's great to kind of have these conversations more uh, more broadly and hear, hear different perspectives. Um, you know, we see a fair number of kind of bright spots in this climate conversation in the power space or in the electric um, utility space that we, when you look across all the states that have adopted either a 
some version of a clean energy standard or renewable energy standard or deep decarbonization. So target uh, net neutral um, or you know 80 by 50, something of, of that equivalent and add them up across the country. Um, those states represent 47% of the customer load in the country already. Um, and so while we wish that there were federal leadership on climate issues, states are um, filling that gap now and moving forward. Um, and even um, kind of commitments that aren't specific to the, say, electric power, and it's a broader, you know, 80 by 50 or some sort of Paris commitment um, in a particular state, when you look across the studies of how do you achieve that, um, there's pretty much consensus that the power industry is where you can, the most technologically available, um, relatively lower cost decarbonization is gonna come as you then um, start to support electrification and decarbonization in other areas of the economy. So we think that there's a lot of, um, of kind of good story going on right now um, at, at the state level. And so that's where our, our primary focus um, has been. The difficulty though, is that the power markets that we operate in are regulated by the federal government, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, and so there are disconnects between the policies that are being adopted at the state level um, and the policies that the uh, this current administration wants to pursue through federal regulation. Um, and so that is, I think, kind of one of the most significant challenges that we face is that our current power markets were not structured for decarbonization. That's not the goal that they were trying to achieve. And so you kind of can't criticize them for that. Um, with lower natural gas costs, um, we've driven significant savings in the electric power industry in terms of um, kind of customer benefits for reliable energy. Um, but that climate component, um, the carbon component is, is simply not there because the markets were never asked to do that. Um, so instead the states are pursuing technology specific paths, um, an economy wide carbon price, you know, would be great and it would solve a lot of these problems. Um, it's gonna require a, a breakthrough in political will that, that frankly we're not holding our breath for. Um, and so instead we're looking at what are the opportunities that are that are realistic and, and staying focused on that and then trying to manage that um, disconnect and relationship between the, the federal government and the states. Great, thanks Mason, very helpful. And uh, we'll, we'll turn to Swami in just a second. I just wanted to mention that you mentioned, um, you know, uh, lack of action at the federal level. I should mention that um, today and tomorrow we have um, the biggest uh, virtual advocacy day where businesses are actually um, weighing in with Congress virtually on um, on climate and carbon pricing being a piece of it, but also sort of building back better being a, a big component of it as well. So we are continuing to um, uh, to make the case and Ceres is actively engaged uh, in, in that area because um, we do see that as a really high priority to um, you know to, to try to get the uh, the stimulus funding uh, invested properly and then also eventually get to carbon pricing uh, so um, finally we have Swami um, you know I, we've known each other for quite a while I know you've been um, an analyst following both this sector uh, and and ESG issues for quite some time with with a ratings agency um, uh, position and 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 really looking at it from a debt and credit rating standpoint. So, what's your perspective about this carbon transition, how it's playing out, and also even um, how it's being impacted by the pandemic? Sure. Uh, thank you, Dan. And and Ceres is an important partner to Moody's in our ESG efforts. So uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel to share our uh, perspectives. Um, I think we've seen a lot of impact already on the utility industry uh, from a credit quality perspective. Um, and maybe if um, I want to start by briefly talking about Europe um, to set the context for the US. If you look at, if, if we did a study of how European utility ratings have changed over the last dozen years or so from 2008 onwards, right? And what we found was the average rating of the European utility sector in 2008 was an A2 whereas the average rating today is about a BAA2. So that's three notches lower, one full rating category lower compared to where it was about a dozen years ago. And in a, sector, in a sector like utilities that is normally considered a defensive sector and a stable sector, that's a dramatic move. And, and that sort of illustrates 
the potential for climate change. And we, we looked at the reason for, um, for all these rating moves and a vast majority of them really had to do with, uh, with, with various aspects of climate change, whether that's a growth in renewable energy or the troubles of you know, um, coal and gas generation, or it, they had to do with mergers and acquisitions, which were done in part keeping climate change in mind. Um, so, so that's the context there. And, and, and in, in, in Europe, we saw a couple of factors really driving all of these changes other than the MA itself. We had um, a broadly unregulated market, which is very different from the US. Um, our generation is almost entirely unregulated. And so the impact on the generators in Europe was substantial. So looking at, looking at um, the US, what I see fundamentally um, as, as being different in a significant way is the fact that a lot of generation is regulated. There is also unregulated generation, of course, in some markets like PJM and California and so on. And I would say to the extent you look at these markets, you, you, you have already seen a lot of rating action on unregulated generators. And that is reflected in uh, a, a number of different factors. Uh, in the US specifically, we have very low natural gas prices, which has also had a market price driven impact on, on credit ratings. Um, but looking back at the sector in transition, there was one thing that I would like to note about the US sector and uh, about the US utility sector, which is that the clean power plan really put a target of about a 30% reduction in emissions by 2030 compared to 2005, roughly. That was, the, that was the clean power plan that the Obama administration proposed. That was going to be the US plan to meet its goals under the Paris Agreement and so on. Um, what happened was the clean power plan never got implemented. The US um, is now working towards exiting the Paris Agreement uh, itself. However, what's interesting is if you look at the actual emissions of the US utility sector at the end of 2019, that number was already 30% below its peak in 2007. So you have a dramatic situation whereby market forces, which is primarily uh, low gas prices, and the uh, market forces in a different way, which is renewable, low falling cost of renewable energy, have together achieved what was the goal of the clean power plan about 10 years ahead of schedule without any regulations actually being put in place and actually being implemented. So I think that's something um, very noteworthy in terms of where US utility carbon emissions are, right? So looking forward, I definitely see the transition in the industry happening despite the lack of federal action. Um, and that the lack of federal action has in many ways failed to really uh, constrain the transition that the US utility sector has been seeing um, over all these years. Um, going forward, I think, you know, if you look at where the credit impact might be, I would again point to really two key factors. Generation is really what is more, uh, what is more important. And then whether generation is regulated or not is a key factor um, to the extent that regulations continue to support cost recovery of existing coal fire generation. One could make the argument that there really should not be as much of a negative impact even on uh, utilities that own a lot of coal fire generation. So to the extent that they need to shut down um, and, and certainly a lot of coal fire generation today is uh, uneconomic in many, many aspects, it really boils down to how regulators treat uh, the cost recovery associated with these assets. So, yeah. so that's one aspect. And then the other aspect is, I think some of the earlier speakers alluded to it, um, climate change is as much an opportunity for utilities as it is a risk, because the utility is the only sector where you actually have um, low carbon sources of energy. That's is really electricity is the most, I mean, you could potentially talk about biofuels and so on, but fundamentally electricity is a source of low carbon energy. And even hydrogen, people talk of using electricity to produce hydrogen, right? So electricity is a source of low carbon energy. So there's a lot of opportunity here, whether that is smart grids, whether that's building new renewables, whether that is in terms of growing demand for electrification of transportation or even electrification of home heating that some, you know, that's, there's some talk, it's still sort of in the fringes. Um, so I see there's as much opportunity as there is risk for utilities. Um, and for regulated utilities, there is a lot of potential for, it, it's a lot depending on how regulators deal with it. So what Moody's is doing is really, we need to take a very comprehensive approach that looks at all of these variables. And what we are doing is we are creating a framework 
called Carbon Transition Risk Assessment Framework. We're doing that across all carbon intensive sectors, including utilities. Uh, unfortunately, I was hoping we might be able to speak about it in more detail in this panel, but we are not yet in a place where we've published it. But hopefully that should be something that comes out very soon. And yeah. it will be something that addresses all of these factors in detail and allow for a rank ordering of on a company specific basis in terms of the carbon transition risk that they face. Yeah, great. No, and and I, I can't speak for everyone, but I will I am eager to see it. So, you know, keep us posted. We're looking forward to, to digging in on that. Um, wow, you, you threw a lot out there. I mean, one thing I want to um, uh, react to just as moderator is um, uh, you, you framed very, uh, very nicely how the sector has made, uh, you know, pretty steep reductions consistent with the clean power plan already. Um, and I, you know, that, that is very encouraging. Um, and what we also know is that it, in the wake of, or, you know, the IPCC's 1.5 C report, um, we know that we actually needed, uh, we need reductions much steeper than the clean power plan. That was sort of the initial uh, down payment and that the power sector, as you mentioned, has such a key role to play. So, uh, the focus really now is on accelerating um, the pace of reduction so that we we get even further aligned with the science. But that I, I completely agree that we've made um, huge progress. And actually, state policy, with the vacuum in federal leadership, it's state policy um, that has driven a lot of that. So um, all uh, very helpful here. I want to turn, I mean, I feel like there's, there's a lot of things we could sink our teeth into here, but um, I do want to turn back a lot of people have mentioned natural gas and the role of natural gas um and you know it clearly is is needed in this transition uh but there's a lot of debate right now I, I, around natural gas and you know i feel like with coal it's pretty clear what the trajectory is even if we could talk a little bit about the pace and what some of the um you know the pace of coal plant retirements but with natural gas um there's definitely concern about an over reliance and an overbuild in some parts of the country um, and uh, and also, you know, really, we, we keep learning more and more about the upstream issues, the methane leakage, um, and uh, and you know, the, will we be able to really achieve alignment with our greenhouse gas reduction goals if we uh, place too much investment in um, natural gas? So I know a few of you have touched on it, but who wants to chime in on how they think about what role uh, natural gas has to play as we decarbonize? Well, let, let me start off. <laughs> um, I, I think I think partly you're right. We've already seen some opposition to new natural gas in some states where they are effectively asking utilities to go back and re-examine not needing new natural gas and instead going with renewables and storage as a combination. Um, my personal um, 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 view is that in states like the Midwest and the Southeast, where there is substantial coal that is yet to retire, you may see uh, natural gas being seen as a, as a stepping stone to uh, getting to uh, the transition phase, if you will. Um, in, in other regions where natural gas is already a dominant fuel, you will probably see a greater demand that you just look at a move to say solar and storage or, 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 or wind and storage and so on. Um, and I think some of this um, may also be dependent on the kind of resources that are available. In places like the Great Plains, um, utilities like Excel Energy have already talked about steel for fuel, where they're able to take, um, replace, uh, bring on new wind at a cost that's below the operating cost of coal plants, not even the capital cost, but below even the operating cost of coal plants. Um, and where there's, there's still plenty of transmission interconnectivity that the, the, the variability of wind generation can be accommodated, you might, you might see um, a, a move to that as well. But especially in Southeast or places where, where wind isn't so strong, you might see natural gas still emerge as a bridge fuel before a move to a greater share for uh, renewables. Great. And I have a quick quick follow. I already gave my view on what's going on in the gas market and new builds, but actually something that Mason said made me think this is actually really important to look at the state policies and how they're maturing. So we know 2019 was an extremely aggressive year for states setting higher and higher RPS policies. With that, I believe there's really a maturity of those policies. When you go from a 
10 or 20% RPS that was really trying to kickstart an industry to now having this RPS be the vehicle for driving decarbonization up to 75 or 100%. There's a big question about what technologies really can get a piece of that pie now. And there's a lot going on in New York and California and other places trying to decide who really is eligible for that and in PGM as well. So the, the nuclear subsidies are a product of people realizing that nuclear had to be a part of that and it was a fairly relatively cheap source of carbon abatement if you wanted to get up to those levels. And we just saw a new uh, transmission line announced uh, further approval today to bring uh, hydropower from Quebec into Maine, into the New England uh, power market. Uh, New York is finally starting to recognize the, the kind of the value really of large hydro and its renewable targets as well, where for a long time it was really a, a smaller hydro kind of upgrade retrofit sort of eligibility that was allowed. So there's this new group of particularly nuclear and hydro that's getting in on the upper parts of these RPS targets. And I think it's taking that to, and you have to have those resources as, as Swami said, if you have those and if your part, if your policy recognizes it, you can start to think about um, kind of nix, nixing gas uh, at the, when you're getting to those levels of penetration. But I think you need that combination. Yeah, very helpful. Anyone want to jump in on, on this one before we move on to another question? Sure, I'll, I'll just add that the, the, I appreciate the raising the, the discussion at the state level as to what the policy would look like driving to 100%, 100%. 100% what you know fill in the blank that that the interplay of the resources becomes just as important as the underlying economics of each individual resource so swami was saying yes renewable prices are coming down but there are seasonal variability issues associated with a system that's run entirely on renewables that can be overcome with current technologies it's just really expensive to do so and so the question is what would longer duration storage, you know, seasonal type of variability, how would you manage that in a renewable system as opposed to a clean system? Um, and so pairing nuclear with renewable with storage to reach an overall lower system cost perspective, even though the individual unit costs of each resource in that system are obviously going to be diff different. And so um, these are very interesting conversations that are occurring in the states right now as kind of the laboratories to, to figure this stuff out. At some point, I, I believe, um, hopefully in the relatively near future, but you know, maybe it's going to take longer, we're going to have these conversations at the federal level of what that policy would look like. And hopefully that's going to be informed by the learning that's going on in the states. Couldn't agree with you more there. Thank you for that. And just a reminder to the audience, we are getting a few questions in, but feel free to um, put a question in the chat box and we will do our best to get to it. Um, Eva, did you, I, I want to make sure if you have an opportunity, if you want to jump in on that, you can, otherwise we'll keep moving. Okay, great. Um, so let's let's go on to um, the, a question really that that focuses on companies that that are struggling with setting goals because we it, it has been interesting to see how for a while companies just they wouldn't do it they because they couldn't see the pathway um but what we saw is you know some companies broke the ice and then we saw this ratcheting up of ambition but there is still this dynamic where some companies um in the power sector uh don't have enough confidence um to set a net zero goal so they're maybe calling it an aspirational net zero goal and that's because they don't see the clear pathway but other companies are saying, well, we agree, we don't see the clear pathway, but we think it's important to say that we need to be aligning with the science and we need to send the market signal to technology developers that these that this innovation needs to happen. I'm curious who has thoughts about um, you know, the value of that um, of that stretch goal. Well, I would just add maybe another another challenge to the list you just gave, which is that um, you know you even see some companies um, hesitant uh, to jump, given given what they've seen with uh, the trend of the cost curve, particularly when you look at something like solar, um, hesitant to jump 
feet first because they see that well maybe you know maybe they don't want to lock in you know that the those those higher costs and wait for costs to fall further right so there's this this constant hesitation to adopt these new technologies which of course you know ad infinitum kind of puts you in a bad place but but i we've we've heard that hesitation as well that um that you know, just seeing the the history of the cost curve um, can also be, uh, in you know, ironically, um, a disincentive. Yeah, fair point. Others? Well, I, or so I mean, it looked like you're you're about to talk. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I see the value of these targets because if you look back to the journey that renewables has taken, especially solar, for example, right? It was kickstarted globally by Germany's own aggressive targets. And then within the US, you could say California in 2008 and 9 when they signed. And if you look at those, some of those initial contracts in the US context, California's pricing was over $200 a megawatt hour, those original contracts. Today, solar pricing is at $3, I mean, three cents or so $30 a megawatt hour, right? So in, in some sense, you need you need specific targets to kickstart this virtuous cycle of falling costs, increasing demand, driving down cost, which in turn increases demand further and in turn drives down costs further, right? So you need that virtuous cycle. So I see the value of the target. Um, so, um, so I think to the extent that uh, you see increasing um, targets now, I think it, it, in addition to the falling costs, it also, in my mind, uh, reflects the fact that there is greater understanding and greater, uh, um, greater desire to act upon climate change goals. I think now they, they, you see a combination of both of that. You, know, you, you see prices coming down, but you also see, okay, climate change is an issue. We need to act on it. You see, you see that happening at the same time, I think which is driving. So today, I think in terms of goals, where, where it might be very useful is in the, in the context of storage, because that seems to be the, I don't want to call it the silver bullet, but it is, you know, it is. It comes somewhat close to that in terms of, you know, um, uh, supporting a greater penetration of renewables. Uh, and so, to the extent you have goals uh, that specifically ask for uh, storage to be a part of that mix, I think that would that that could help um, you know, uh, take that spur that same virtuous cycle again. Makes sense. Yeah, and I was just going to add that. Um, so the way that our our company kind of thinks about about goals is we, we start from where we are, um, and and we welcome uh, the number of companies making you know 2040 and 2050 commitments um, because we we feel like they're kind of coming into our club, even though you know to be blunt, we don't have one of those goals. Um, and it's because as you started out um, acknowledging the Exelon generation fleet is so clean. In 2020, we are already where companies, if you follow out their projections, um, are hoping to be in 2040 to 2050. Um, and so we, our focus is on our operations and reducing carbon emissions in our operations because our, our generation fleet is already so um, so clean. We produce one out of every nine clean megawatts in, in, in the country. Um, so as while we support the goals that are being adopted by other com other companies, uh, we are anxious to see how they how they get there. Um, right? Um, we we view our emissions-free energy as not appropriately valued in the current market structures. And the more companies that are seriously investing in clean technologies are are going to demand that that gets corrected. Um, and so there's a an additional value in our mind uh, associated with that kind of regulatory market conversation that occurs as we all get aligned on what our goals are. Great. Um, all right, moving on to um, another thing. Um, for some of you that may have seen yesterday's session, um, it was with uh, the CEO of NRG Energy, so big, um, a big energy company in uh, deregulated markets and with a lot of um, electricity retail operations. Uh, the CEO, Mauricio Gutierrez, spoke a lot about how the industry and his company is really shifting to be much more customer focused and really just provide a range of options for customers to enable them to both uh, buy clean energy and adapt their or and adjust their um, their loads as as they're as they're able so I'm, I'm curious um if any of you uh have thoughts about how critical it is to be really transitioning and pivoting to be more customer focused for this industry 
and um, maybe Eva, if you want to start things off. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I'd I'd love to comment, uh, particularly from from what we've seen in in the Hawaii context. I'm, um, you know, uh, many of you are probably aware, but um, one emerging form of uh, regulation I think uh, worth mentioning in this context is performance based rate making or or PBR, uh, which is very much in process in Hawaii. It's already state law, um, and there's a large handful of other states looking at it as well. Um, the idea is for a utility's revenue to be uh, linked to performance rather than purely capital investment, um, as we all know it's been historically. And at the most basic level, uh, PBR mechanisms um, being considered by states are to really kind of almost basic tools like um, multi-year rate plans rather than, than annual rate cases um, and revenue decoupling. Um, not all regulators are, are really ready yet, I think, to put teeth behind this. Uh, but where Hawaii has been leading is putting financial incentives in place and, and creating accountability, essentially. So um, it was put into state law two or three years ago now. Um, phase one was defining what is really most critical to the state's 100% uh, renewable energy goals, what, kind, what kinds of um, regulatory mechanisms and, and tariffs essentially to set. Um, and phase two has been determining the financial structures to enforce them, or PIMS, uh, the performance incentive mechanisms. And um, you know the metrics the utility might be required to perform on um, are aspects such as, you know, efficiency, reliability, customer service, um, greenhouse gas emissions, and these are essentially um, incentivizing uh, benefits to customers and to grid health rather than to capital intensity, which isn't necessarily um, always aligned with those effects. And of course, it's still a work in progress, um, but I think it's a demonstration of the evolution of the utility business model, which um, you know, which I think that the comments were really referring to towards uh, lowering rates for customers while also increasing revenue potential um, for utilities. In fact, there was a, um, a Wood McKenzie report last year that found, not surprisingly at all, a correlation between uh, states with strong renewable energy commitments uh, and PBR activity. At the time, I think it was nine of the 11 states uh, with renewable or carbon-free goals um, set by their legislators had also been considering PBR of some kind. And so, you know, I think that's that's generally a reflection of, of of exactly what you're what you're talking about. Great. Anyone else want to jump in on this one? Sure, I can um, add that we, we don't frequently agree, Exelon doesn't frequently agree with NRG on uh, matters of state clean energy policy. Um, they, they are opposed to a lot of the state actions that, that we're um, supporting. They voted last week against Pennsylvania moving forward with Reggie. Um, but on this point, I'd say we agree um, that the customer needs to be front and center in everything we do. We just have a different perspective of what we think the customers um, kind of want and are demanding. So on our utility side, um, we have we call it the connect the community strategy but essentially it's a vision of what the utility of the future looks like where we are a platform that enables the customer to achieve what it wants to achieve and we think that's going to be a, a cleaner brighter future but um you know if that's not what our customers choose well we've got the platform that's there to enable what their choices are um, on the competitive side we we are one of the largest retail competitive suppliers um, in the country. And again, that's that's purely driven by what um, customers want and customers demand. And so we're kind of constantly evolving our products, um, primarily in the, the clean space to connect um, customers to clean sources of power that don't want to have to deal with kind of the business of power operations, right? We can, we can handle that for them and just give them the product that we want. Um, but the customer needs to be front and center in everything we do, whether it's on the utility side or on the power side. Right. I, I would just add to say that um, companies are probably seeing <clears throat> um, customer, being customer focused as another source of margins and profitability going forward. It was not historically the case. You know, it, it used to be, you know, the customer almost didn't matter, um, you know, because everybody was just consuming electric electricity as a commodity. But now you see different things. You see deregulation where, uh, where you have retail uh, services. Customers are choosing their retail energy provider, and that's probably uh, one of the points energy reason energy emphasized that because their Texas retail business is really a cash cow for the company um, while not all retail operations are as profitable as the Texas uh, market 
there is definitely a source of margin there, a few dollars per megawatt hour, let's put it that way, which is valuable. Um, and in, in future, if you can combine that with energy services or the ability to provide customers with clean energy um, and, and, and other aspects to it, there is another source of margin there from retail and energy services, um, which did not exist before. And so I think that's uh, as generation becomes less uh, profitable, less, less of a focus for companies, I think uh, retail focus automatically uh, brings up a different source of uh, margins and, and, and revenues. Great. All right, and um, yeah, so let's um, let's turn back to you know this interesting time we're in with this pandemic, where you know so many industries have been really uh, impacted significantly, and certainly um, utilities and the power sector are are um, are part of that. Um, and many have really called this uh, pandemic the great reveal, and that it's exposed so many different issues. Uh, it's definitely exposed deep problems with the oil and gas industry. And um, and I think, you know, right now there is, you know, some competition between electric power and oil and gas because of um, uh, the, the, the need to electrify more and more of our economy in order to achieve our climate goals. So um, some would argue that the electric power sector is at a, at a fairly significant relative advantage coming as we emerge from this pandemic. So um, I'm curious. Uh, if some of you have thoughts about um, if we could actually accelerate the pace of electrification and help achieve some of our goals um, as we emerge uh, from this pandemic. Um, maybe we'll start with Nick. Uh, do, do you have thoughts about uh, what you're seeing relative to that? Well, to start concretely, what we've seen is a reduction in demand nationally. So by region, we've seen reductions of about 5 to 15%. We actually built out a model to track what uh, actual load has looked like in each region and compare it to uh, a model business as usual number. So we built, built out a model to estimate what demand would have been given weather conditions, given sunlight, what would have been demand in New York today and then compared to actual values. And it's been a, between about five and 15% across the country. And that's the that's the concrete impact. I would imagine it's too soon to say what this is really going to mean in the in the year and in, in years to come. But I would say it's simple, really a simple view, but hopefully a meaningful one is I think it'll increase the way that people decide to plan for these sorts of global widespread events. And I think climate change really fits right into that. So I know it's a simple point, but maybe. Um, somebody else can give us some, some some more specific nuance, but I would I would personally I would feel that it would drive people to to do more, really to do more in planning. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, sure. I can jump in on that. I mean, I I I take the glass half full as well um, view that that we are there, there's certainly going to be a lot of focus on stimulus, right, um, coming out of, out of the pandemic. And as so we have a choice of where dollars are going, and if, if you can invest dollars that are going to solve or at least contribute to the solution of climate change while building our economy, that to me is just a no-brainer. Um, but there's a lot of politics involved in deciding those questions, and so we'll see how they play out. Um, one thing that, that we, we will need to keep in mind is just build pressure um, that, that a lot of folks are, are hurting economically, um, and, and so increasing uh, costs on customer bills to fund anything, um, how, however um, worthy the, the investment, is going to be very, uh, you know, we'll just have to weigh that carefully. Um, and so we've had that front in mind as, as we've been working with states on what clean energy expansion, you know, the retention of existing resources and expanding for new renewables, what that can look like and, and what the, um, the kind of margin is on the, the bill to be able to, to support that. And, and so it's just... I think those those issues and concerns and perspectives are just even more important. Yeah, I, I don't know that I would necessarily uh, pose it uh, the the pandemic itself as a key driver of the competition between oil and, and electricity. I think that competition is a, is a is a trend that's been around for a while. We all recognize the need for increasing electrification. Um, so I think if at all it has a direct impact, to me, 
there are two ways that can happen. One is, uh, and I, th I think as uh, you know, uh, Nick said earlier as well, it might just change the attitude of people towards environmental issues. You know, people can see how these things can affect um, uh, our human civilization. And if, if we don't want this to happen, and if the climate, they might start taking climate change more seriously. So that's sort of one angle. The, the other is the more specifics of how the pandemic is going to affect da daily life. So if working from home becomes a bigger, more accepted part of the landscape, one arguably would need lesser office space going forward than you needed in the past. And that might have impact in terms of the nature of electricity demand or heating demand. You know, if you have few lesser office space than before, what does it do for demand, both for electricity and also, you know, fewer people commuting, that might mean lesser demand for uh, you know, oil uh, for, for commuting purposes. So you have all of these things, um, which which uh, which sort of an, have an indirect impact on this demand competition between uh, oil and and, but I don't know necessarily whether directly, uh, you know, if there's any other way in which the pandemic itself would determine what happens. So I think it's more how pandemic affects our attitude towards climate change and our attitude towards how we live a daily life. Right. All right. Um... I do want to turn to, uh, we have some audience questions coming in and we should make sure and feel free to add any. We have a few minutes left here. Um, one of them relates back to the conversation we had about um, policy at the state and federal level. And the question is, um, do we need state clean energy regulations if a carbon tax is passed at the federal level? And it, let me just maybe modify that a little bit to say, you know, it, let's assume it's a it's a meaningful uh, carbon price uh, at the federal level. What do people think about um, the role of state policy if we can get federal um, uh, meaningful federal carbon price? I, I I can jump in and others please add. I I think you'll you'll need both. Um, that that the meaningful carbon price is something, you know, approaching the social cost of carbon is gonna drive a significant amount of decarbonization, but it's not going to lead to technology development for say offshore wind. The, the carbon price that would be needed to support an offshore project is, would be significant. Um, and, and so I think that there will still be a role for states to say, you know, I, I care about um, other things, right? Other particular technologies. I don't want to reflect that in my policy while achieving decarbonization. And so carbon pricing is a tool, one of the tools in the toolbox, um, one of the best tools we think, um, but it's not going to completely resolve all state or the, the need of some states to pursue supporting policies. I would add one more, um, uh, one more reason for that, which is in the U.S., a lot of generation is regulated, and in a regulated market, even if the coal generator had to buy uh, carbon credits, uh, the company can just pass that through as a cost. So it would really, it, it while it would influence any new generation being built, it would it would have limited impact on existing coal-fired generation, unless the state worked with the companies in some way. To include, uh, look at look at the operating cost of these coal plants, including carbon, and then actively decide to shut them down because there are other options available. So you couldn't you couldn't automatically expect just the carbon price alone to to give you the coal shutdowns that you will need. Yeah. Yeah. One more one more follow up, but now for the competitive looking at the competitive markets, I think that we'll see as as the these targets get ratcheted up higher and higher and include ever more types of resources and different plants it starts to feel more like patchwork within the competitive markets and i think that that's going to end up causing some problems and i think that's particularly why we see more more companies coming out in favor of carbon pricing uh, that, that might actually actually work better than than such high targets at least as obligated mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, just a, uh, just a flag. I mean, New York is the state to watch on this, right? Um, because they have those high targets. They have very clear statutory paths to get there. And they're thinking about a carbon price. And there's an ongoing proceeding at the, the PSC um, where we and others have made the point that, that these two can live together, that the carbon price can rationalize most of what you're trying to achieve through the market mechanism. And then there's still some 
that's going to be left over given the particular state's policy preferences. Um, but that doesn't mean don't do the carbon price because it can take care of most of the most of the you know quote unquote issues of decarbonization. Yeah, you make a very good point though about offshore wind, Mason. Yeah. That it's it's one of those that needs a kickstart, and the target is it seems to be better for for doing that. Okay, I know we're, we are unfortunately running out of time. I think we could go for a couple more hours because uh, there's so much terrain to cover. Um, one more question, um, quick one for Swami, um, and then we can, uh, we, we can wrap. Um, a question specifically about, is Moody's adjusting down companies' ratings for U.S. utilities as it relates to gas generation, um, keeping in mind that we, we need to transition uh, pretty aggressively away from gas within the next 10 years, um, which is in advance of the economic life of those existing plants and certainly um, relative to, to new gas development. So that's a very you know specific question about back to the <laughs> gas uh, role. Right, I, I think, I think I, I'm, the question is if it's a utility building new gas, right? The yeah. question of adjusting rating would be looking at the utility in its entirety. Yeah. Uh, if they're building, if they're shutting down coal to build a, and and building a new gas to replace that in in after uh, after approvals by regulators, that's not necessarily something that would that would lead to a lower rating. Um, I think fundamentally um, the ratings, uh, the way we see it, have to continue to speak to uh, probability of default and loss given default. And so it has to fundamentally look at what the sp specifics of that particular company is um, and, 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 and what it needs to do to get to, that, get to those longer term targets. The way, we look at, the way we look at our carbon transition assessments, which I hope will answer this question in greater clarity, is we are focusing both on sort of the near to medium term um, objectives as well as a long term alignment to a two degree uh, goal um, yeah. and, and where the sector as a whole needs to be and where this comp where a particular company is positioned with regard to that. So I think once we publish that framework, I think that would give you a lot more clarity in terms of what we see as high risk and when a gas plant may be negative for credit as opposed to neutral or positive if you're replacing coal with gas. It, it, so it sort of, mm -hmm. I think that, that that framework would be able to explain that better in a company specific context. And once again, we can't wait to see it. So uh, I'm sorry, we do have to wrap. I would love to keep going, um, but I'm being told we need to um, call it a show. Uh, thank you, th thanks to all of you. And also um, thanks to our participants for joining and asking good questions. Thanks to all of our sponsors uh, that you see on this slide here. We really could not have done this without them. And you will receive a follow-up email with the recording of this session. And for those of you that are part of Series 2020, another session on decarbonizing oil and gas will be coming on Thursday, May 14th at noon. So stay tuned for that. And to register and learn more about upcoming sessions, go to www.series2020.org. Thank you again so much. And this session is adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks, guys.